Hi, my name is Erin Hodson. I'm a professor and extension entomologist with Iowa State University, and welcome back to Crops TV. Last month, I was talking about a soybean pest. This month, I'm talking about a corn pest. And actually, I'm, gonna, I'm going to talk about corn rootworm, which is the most frequent question that I do get asked about. I would like to acknowledge Ashley Dean, who helped me create some of these slides, and of course, Dr. Aaron Gassman, who provided a lot of the research that I'm going to talk about today. So you are watching a pre-recorded video, uh, but just to let you know, I'm behind the scenes watching the video the same time as you. And so I encourage you to ask questions along the way as you have them. I'll try to answer those the best that I can. And if I feel like it's better answered verbally, I will wait until the end. And so there'd be plenty of time to answer qu your questions at the end too. So even if you don't plan to ask any questions, I encourage you to open that chat box up just so you can see what the conversation is uh, going on at the same time as, as the video. So let's get started. By the end of my time with you today, I hope that you have a better understanding of pest biology and the injury that corn rootworm causes to corn. And then spend a little bit of time on the benefits of scouting, not only larvae, but adults too. And then with that regular scouting, you'd be able to recognize changes in pest susceptibility to the management strategies you're using for corn rootworm. And then the majority of the time, I will talk about understanding management options for long-term sustainable production of corn. And that's going to be backed up with a lot of research from the Gassman Lab. And just to make sure we're all on the same page, I just wanted to briefly touch on biology and plant injury to get us started. So there's two species that we care about in Iowa and throughout much of the Corn Belt. They're both in the same family of leaf beetles. The northern corn rootworm on the left is the bright limey green one, and the western corn rootworm is yellowish or brown with some dark markings on the wings. Like all beetles, corn rootworm goes through a complete life cycle with four distinct life stages, egg, larva, pupa, and adult. And right here in January, they're in the egg life stage uh, in the soil. So that's how they spend the winter. When soil temperatures warm up in the spring, those eggs will hatch into larvae. And that's the main, that's the main feeding stage where the larvae like to feed on corn roots. So they'll go through three instars, approximately a week each feeding on corn. Then they'll move into a pupation stage where they build a little earthen cocoon also in the soil. And then for the only time in the life cycle, they'll emerge above ground as an adult where they are interested in eating, mating, and laying eggs. And they're active for about six to eight weeks. Now a little bit more about the biology. There's been a lot of research, of course, for these significant pests. And in general, accumulation of uh, development from egg to an adult happens on a predictable degree day units. And in general, westerns develop faster than northerns and males develop faster than the females. So males usually come out three to five days before the females do. Now on the right, you, you see I have some color variation for each species. And on the top, you see Western corn rootworm, the females on the left, and it's sort of a, a gradient from three distinct stripes to a kind of a black smudge on the four wings with the males on the right. And then Northerns have some color variation too. You see the what I normally see would be the bright limey green ones, uh, but you could also see some brown and tan ones out in the landscape too. Now, a female uh, is capable of laying around 400 or 500 eggs, and her preference is to lay them about six inches under the soil line. That depends quite a bit on soil texture and moisture in the soil. Uh, they, both of these species rely on local movement to, to mate and lay eggs, and so typically it's around 40 meters per day. So they are going to move within fields, and between fields on a, for about that six to eight weeks. And they're not considered long distance migrators that you would think of for like European corn borer or uh, black cutworm. Now I did mention they have a complete life cycle and generally this life cycle happens once per year or univolting. So the females lay eggs and corn, that's how they overwinter, those eggs will hatch. And if corn is planted in that field next year, the larvae will have something to eat. Uh, but we do have two genetic variants in Iowa and also in some places in the Corn Belt. So the Western corn rootworm variant uh, is a, a workaround to crop rotation in which the female will lay eggs in soybean. Over winters in old soybean fields, so hopefully corn is planted in that field next year, so the larvae will have something to eat. 
The northern corn rootworm also has a genetic variant in which the eggs persist in the soil for two or more years called extended diapause. And so both of these are ways to, uh, uh, to, to work around the corn soybean rotation that happens quite a bit throughout Iowa. And so the intensity or the level of these variants in Iowa is highly variable. I would rely on your extension field agronomist to better understand, even within a county or on a farm, the level of variance in your neighborhood. Now I care about the larvae the most as far as impacting yield, and that's because the larvae are feeding on corn roots. They can uh, severely prune them back or destroy them, and ultimately their feeding disrupts nutrient and water uptake. Of course, that directly would impact the yield because it's not getting everything that it needs to grow properly, but you have very tall plants on a small root system and it makes them, those plants unstable. So if you have a high wind event or you have a derecho, you could have corn that falls down. And sometimes, depending on when these wind events happen, the corn uh, cannot right itself and it stays down or dies. But in other cases, it's going to try and grow back up and it, you get that classic goosenecking. So if the plant survives uh, and it is gooseneck, it can make harvest a real challenge because the combines have to go really slow to pick up the ears and it can be very frustrating. So taking a closer look at the root injury caused by the larvae, there was a huge meta-analysis conducted by Nick Tinsley in Illinois that identified uh, those rings or those nodes of roots uh, and the associated injury or yield loss that comes along with that. And what he found is that for every node of roots that are pruned back to your first knuckle is approximately 15% yield loss. And there are three major nodes that contribute to nutrient and water uptake. So you could have three nodes destroyed as shown in, these, in this photo and it's really, it would be approximately 45% yield loss. And any other type of stress, whether it's biotic or abiotic, say you have moisture stress, you have pathogens in the corn, or you have other insect pests, that injury can be compounded on top of the larval injury. Okay, transitioning to part two, where I just wanted to refresh you on scouting and using thresholds to make treatment decisions. Now, as I mentioned before, the rootworms develop to an adult based on accum accumulating heat units, just like plants. And so I use a weather network around Iowa to track accumulating soil temps um, all, all throughout the state. And these are just a few of the stations that I use. So we know that every spring is a little bit different. 2020 was nice and warm, so temperatures accumulated faster. And the benchmark really is around 700 degree days. And so most of you know the southern counties would warm up faster than the northern counties. And so every year I would put out a map like this where I predict egg hatch throughout the state through a free online newsletter called ICM News. So I encourage you to subscribe to that. So you may be asking, why do I care about egg hatch? Well, it's important because approximately four weeks after egg hatch is when I would at first to expect to see adults. And I know the larvae have finished their round of feeding. So seeing adults in the field is my cue to assess root injury. I want to look at the root system while the injury is fresh so I can see pitting, scarring, browning, or any type of discoloration, and then of course the pruning of those major, root, those major uh, roots. I don't want to wait until August or September because some hybrids uh, will put on a lot of regrowth or bottle brushing and it becomes more difficult to assess injury. And so I want to assess the injury while it's fresh, but it's also a cue for me four weeks after egg hatch to begin my adult monitoring program if you're interested. So Iowa State and most people who assess root injury for different management strategies are using a zero to three scale. And really assessing root injury is the most accurate way to assess your management strategy, or maybe you're using a couple things to suppress larval numbers. And it's fairly intuitive. So if you have 10 roots anywhere on the root system pruned back to your first knuckle, uh, that would be a score of a one. 20 injured roots would be a two, and 30 would be a three. So remember, if you have a node gone or 10 roots gone, it's equivalent to 15% yield loss. And so just to keep that in mind, the EPA says that you should never experience a 0.5 or greater injury if you're using a pyramided BT trait. 
And in my experience, if you have adequate moisture and in most soils in Iowa, you would probably not notice this level of injury or stress to corn uh, because corn is adapted very well. So you're not likely to see five pruned roots. So corn is probably going to be straight even after heavy winds. And so really the only way to know that you've reached this level, this, this important cutoff, is if you're digging plants, washing them on, and washing them and then assessing for root injury. But uh, it is tedious, it's hard work, and so not everybody's in favor of this, even though it really is the most accurate way to assess injury. So that should be a red flag. Uh, you know, that 0.5 is a big red marker uh, that hopefully you, you, you're, not, um, you're not seeing in the field. If you're not interested in digging up plants, you can still assess activity by monitoring for adults. And I recommend these yellow trace A sticky cards and you can attach them right to the corn stalk. And there's been quite a bit of research on how to do this to accurately assess activity in the field. And so we've developed this sampling protocol which includes two to three transects per field, four to six traps per transect, and then you're in those fields swapping out the cards and counting all the rootworms, northerns and westerns, on those traps. And so you'd be able to walk away at each sampling period with number of beetles per trap per day. If you were ever over two, that would be considered a threshold for uh, that your likely, likely yield loss is occurring to have that level of adults. That means you had to have so many larvae in that field. But it also is a signal for you uh, to understand what might be happening as far as egg laying in that field and the egg load that's going into the winter. So if you were to plant corn in that field next year, you would expect at least that level of injury and that level of activity. So uh, I'd encourage you if you're interested at all in giving sticky cards a try, I have a rootworm trapping network that we started with Ashley Dean in 2020. We're going to continue in 2021. We'll send you free traps. All we're asking you is to give us the counts. And it is just a, it's a more informal way of assessing activity if you don't wanna do the root injury scores. Okay, I wanted to spend the rest of the time, the majority of the time, talking about management options for corn rootworm. And these are all ideas that have been promoted as suppressing tactics for either the larvae, the adults, or maybe both. And I just want to spend a little bit of time on these with some research updates. I get a lot of questions about adult control, and usually I don't think about the adults as as, as far as causing economic loss, unless I happen to see a lot of adults and you have green silks out, and so pollination isn't complete yet. And if you were to ever see five or more adults per plant and pollination is not complete, you know, you might want to consider taking a, a rescue treatment action to protect that pollination period. But after brown silk, I generally don't care about the adults in that field that year. I'm more worried about uh, the egg lane and what would happen next year if that field was put into corn. But it should be, you know, a red flag. If you're seeing a lot of adults as you're scouting corn, it should be concerning to you, to you no matter what time of year it is. And so just a bit more about the biology. I talked about westerns developing faster than northerns, males developing faster than females. And, uh, but when the females come out of the ground, almost instantly they're mated with males within that first day or two. But they don't start laying eggs until 10 to 14 days after they mate because they need to be feeding on high quality food, which for them is pollen, in order to have those eggs mature and develop. And so on the right, you see a picture of three females who have their abdomens full of mature eggs and they're ready to start laying eggs. And so that, again, they can uh, lay up to around 500 eggs over six to eight weeks in their lifetime. So uh, if you are considering adult control, these are just a couple things to keep in mind. A lot of people want to target foliar sprays during that pollination period. And um, you're, you're spraying basically too early because you're spraying males and females that aren't laying eggs yet. So as additional females come out, uh, they will not be, they will no longer be suppressed by that early uh, pollination period spray. So you'd have to spray it later in the season to have more of an impact. And so again, you have to be able to distinguish the guys from the girls. This is easier to do with Western corn rootworm based on the smudge of the wing cover for the males. Uh, and again, that female, when she's getting ready to lay eggs, her abdomen will become swollen, or you could do what's called a squish test, and most people would be able to see eggs with the naked eye. And you'd want to target applications when you see gravid females. Now, in some summers, this could be 
two or three applications spread over seven to 10 days because that's how long new females would be coming out and laying eggs. And so uh, we have at Iowa State, we haven't been able to produce effective results on an adult program alone. And in all reality, I don't think adult control should be the go-to, the primary management strategy. I'm not sure if it's a profitable choice. Spraying later in the season means uh, using a high boy or an aerial applicator, and the, it's just not effective to spray multiple times in corn given the, the market value of corn. And so uh, most people probably think about the transgenic host plant resistance or BT for corn rootworm. And uh, I have this table here showing that the first protein or trait Cry3BB1 was released in 2003. I, I and most entomologists tend to think about the proteins that are expressed in that genetics, but if you happen to be an industry or a breeder, maybe you think about them as events. But most farmers and people working in egg business, I think, tend to think about the trade names. So because you're looking at seed catalogs and you're looking at a number of other traits that go along with that seed package, in addition to the proteins for BT. And so um, I think it can be somewhat confusing because, for example, Cry3BB1 isn't necessarily reflected in the name yield guard rootworm. So um, just to make sure that you understand that the proteins would vary based on those trait families. So the first one came out in 2003. The last one, eCry3.1AB, came out in 2013. So over a period of 10 years, we had four traits released. Now, if you notice the protein descriptions, we have three of them that say cry 3 something in the name. So these are more closely related to each other than that that fourth one, CRY3435 AB1. And for the proteins that we have for corn rootworm, they would not be considered high dose even at the initial release. And so high dose generally means 99.99% control and which you have susceptible individuals. And we, we see this for some caterpillars for the above ground traits like European corn borer, but we didn't see that level of efficacy for rootworm traits, even at first release. And so I do think it's confusing and because trait packages, trait families are often changing and they're changing what's included with that, including herbicide tolerance and uh, some of the refuge that goes along with that. And so I encourage you to find, and just by Googling BT trait table, every year this gets updated. And they also have a trait table for sweet corn. So if that's of interest to you as well, but I think it's a really nice two pager that summarizes the, the events or the protein that are included. The uh, pests that are targeted with those proteins. And now they've even included a column that includes resistance uh, that's been identified to some of those traits, which is really important, uh, not only for the below ground traits, but now especially for some of the above ground traits as we think about corn production uh, further east of Iowa. And so uh, unfortunately, we have confirmed BT resistance to all four traits in Iowa and through other places in the Corn Belt starting in 2009. So it didn't take very long to identify field evolved resistance to all four traits in our state with the help of the Gasman Lab. And how we did this, I've talked about this in greater length before, but I just wanted to summarize how we assesses the resistance or susceptibility of populations in the field. So Aaron has some lab colonies of Western corn rootworm that you can see in the first two columns that he would consider uh, as susceptible as corn rootworm gets, where you have three to 5% survivorship when they're exposed to BT. Uh, he also would collect individuals from commercial fields where a farmer thinks that they have problems with the performance of BT. And so you can see the, the last five columns are all populations that he collected from the field. And what he ultimately does is uses the offspring from these adults and forces them to feed on different types of BT. So this example, BT are in the black bars and non-BT or refuge corn would be in the gray bars. And he's looking at the proportion of survivors on these two types of corn. So if you look at the first two comparisons, when you have a lab colony forced to feed on BT, you have what would be considered very little survival. So under 5% survivorship. Now this is ideally what you want. You want very few survivors. But unfortunately, when you have individuals collected from problem fields, their offspring uh, are likely to survive. And so for all those comparisons in the field, the individuals really have no difference of survivorship between BT and non-BT corn, and they would be considered highly resistant. So this is the kind of work that Aaron's been doing for over 10 years, collecting 
individuals from the field, and looking at the survivorship of their offspring. I wanted to talk about a few other research that Aaron has going on in his lab. He is interested in understanding how these Western corn rootworms develop resistance and pass it on to their offspring. And uh, he's been doing that in a number of different ways. So uh, he is looking at um, describing the nature of resistance and he would say that it's non-recessive and that if the parents have resistance, their offspring are likely to have those resist resistance genes as well. And he's also looking for fitness costs. Usually if, if a pest species can overcome a management strategy like an insecticide or BT, they don't live as long or maybe they don't produce as many offspring or maybe they have a harder time overwintering. But unfortunately, he's not finding really any fitness costs associated with the, uh, having this level of resistance um, for multiple BT genes. And then he's also looking at the magnitude of resistance. So like how much of the population is resistant compared to susceptible. And so this graph shows a little bit older data, but shows a concept in which he can measure the level of survivorship on his lab colonies shown in the open circles versus those that are collected from problem fields over time. And you can see that separation is increasing and we would expect this separation to only get bigger over time so that the susceptible remain fairly susceptible and the resistant individuals become more resistant and, and that more individuals have that resistance genes. Uh, Aaron is also interested in looking at developmental times of Western and Northern corn rootworm that can uh, survive exposure to different types of strategies. So these bars are kind of small and I just want to run through them for you. We have Westerns on the top, Northerns on the bottom, and then he exposes populations to two types of corn. So you see non-BT corn on the left and BT corn on the right, and then he has different treatments. So control would be like refuge or naked corn, P1250 would be the poncho 1250 or the high rate of insecticidal seed treatment, and then a soil applied insecticide Aztec. And he's looking at how long does it take for those individuals to become adults? That's a big benchmark for a lot of research. And so you see uh, females are in the black and the males are in the gray. So they're kind of complicated graphs, but hopefully if you just generally look at these, both of these graphs, you can see that those individuals that become adults take longer if they're exposed to BT and if they're exposed to other pressures, say sea treatments or soil applied insecticide. And unfortunately, this is causing a separation of susceptible and, re and resistant adults when they're exposed to any type of additional pressure. So for example, if we were to look at the top graph, Western corn rootworm, and we're looking at Western males feeding on non-BT control corn takes them about 18 days to become an adult. So that's about as fast as it can get. That's a very quick developmental time. Now we compare that to a female Western corn rootworm who is feeding on BT corn and has also been exposed to Aztec, a soil applied insecticide. It takes her longer to develop, uh, 42 days. And so if this were a scenario in the field, these are the populations that we want to get together and we want them to mate and hopefully dilute some of those res resistance genetics for that next generation. But unfortunately, these two individuals are not likely to encounter each other. It's a, it's a big enough separation where um, the, that male is going to have a hard time finding that female to mate with. And so in some situations where you have some fields that go from good performance to BT, to within just a few growing seasons, very poor performance of BT, we think ultimately the resistant individuals are mating with resistant individuals, and then the, the susceptible individuals that are produced are not having a good chance to interact. And so this is happening for Westerns and Northerns in the lab, and we think this is what's happening in the field as well. I also get lots of questions about, okay, I don't know if my BT is working, or maybe I think it's working. Should I add a soil applied insecticide on top of it, kind of just as a, as a just-in-case strategy? And Aaron has some data to support that this layering approach of BT and soil insecticides are not recommended. And so I have a graph here on the top that looks at two different types of corn, again, with the same treatments. You have the control or on a naked seed, you have the poncho 1250, and then you have the soil applied Aztec. And he's evaluating root injury in the field in these treatments. And you can see 
that those individuals that are feeding on BT have have very low root injury. So that's a, that's great. That's exactly what you want. If you're not using BT, sometimes the root injury can be very severe. And of course, we all know the yield loss that's associated with that. He's also looking at yield, which is ultimately what the farmers care about. And you can see here that it doesn't necessarily improve yield when you have BT and you put another strategy on top of that. So when, if you look at the top, it appears that you have very low injury we wouldn't associate that with uh, a big yield improvement. And so uh, bottom line, if the BT is working, soil applied insecticides or insecticidal seed treatments do not significantly improve yield. If your BT is not working, then uh, I guess we ask, why are you using the BT? If you think about a couple slides ago, you have about equal survivorship when individuals are resistant. And so why spend the money on BT if you think the performance isn't working? So that's ultimately what you have to decide for yourself is the money investment when you have a strategy that maybe isn't pulling its weight anymore. And so other questions about uh, the efficacy of these is, Aaron also, in addition to looking at the effectiveness of BT, looks at soil applied insecticides at some small plot research around the state. And what he is able to summarize is that soil applied insecticides applied in furrow at the fully labeled rate can work in some situations. So this sort of depends on where you are in the state, how fast that soil warms up and you have egg hatch, and then also just things like moisture, temperature, and even uh, other factors like soil texture can make a big difference. And if you think about, you know, when do people want to plant corn in Iowa? Um, it's sort of those last two weeks of April if conditions are great, maybe the first part of, of May if we're having a cool wet spring. When do corn rootworm eggs hatch? Well, say for Ames example, the uh, average hatching date is around 7 the 10th or June. And so it could be almost a two month period from when you plant the corn to when larvae are feeding on that corn. And so for some situations, you're asking a soil applied insecticide or a seed treatment to hold up and have that killing powder power in the root zone, and it's a very hard ask. And so in general, there's some situations where people have had very good luck with soil applied insecticides, and others just don't really see, see the value in that. So it's almost like you have to do research on your own farm to understand that. But um, that the effectiveness of soil applied insecticides and seed treatments are highly variable. But in general, Aaron would say that seed treatments don't work in a meaningful way for corn rootworm. Again, that period from when people plant to when larvae are actively feeding is a long period. And seed treatments are really meant to protect the seed and seedlings. So we wouldn't expect that to have a lot of killing power in June and July. Uh, also, a few other updates, just to kind of summarize uh, what I've been talking about for Western corn rootworm. Again, all four traits have confirmed field evolved resistance. There is cross resistance between all the, the three CRY3 traits, but they haven't identified cross resistance with that fourth trait, CRY34, 35, AB1 yet. But in general, Aaron would say that the number of problem fields with BT performance is increasing in the state that can be found throughout the state now. It's not just a, a north of I-80 uh, issue anymore. And the range is expanding beyond Iowa into other states as well. Now, Aaron certainly identifies fields and will sample fields where people say they have a problem. And 10 plus years, if someone thinks they have a problem, in a year, he will tell you, yes, you have resistant individuals. It takes a very long time to get those results, but the answers are generally, yes, you have more individuals surviving than should. But he also uh, spot checks commercial fields not known to have any type of performance issue. You don't necessarily see a ton of adults. You don't have goose necked or lodged corn, and he does the same process. And, and in this research, he's identified that CRY3 resistance is also confirmed in those fields not known to have any type of problem. And at this point, he said he would assume some level of CRY3 resistance in all Iowa cornfields. Uh, you may have heard about resistance to northern corn rootworm. It's a species that uh, is getting a little bit more attention in Iowa, in which, especially if you're sampling using the adult uh, sticky card method. Some people are just noticing more northern rootworm activity in the last couple of years. Well, a North Dakota entomologist and her lab, Janet Knodel, identified uh, 
poor performance in 2016 and was eventually able to confirm resistance to CRY3, CRY3 BB1 and CRY3435 AB1. Uh, this resistance is not known to occur outside of North Dakota at this time, but seeing a dramatic uptick in northern cornworm activity in your field and seeing um, poor, poor performance of BT and you're not sure if it's westerns or northerns, uh, we'll have to assume at some point that the resistance will be confirmed in Iowa. So if you have a field with poor performance, you're noticing a lot of northerns, I know uh, Aaron Gassman would be very interested in coming collecting from those fields, so please keep in touch. Okay, what's next for corn rootworm? You may be wondering what is the latest and greatest technology beyond BT. And you may have heard about RNAi, or interference uh, technology used for pest management. This technology is highly specific to the species, so it's going to be specific to northern and western corn rootworm. And really what happens, I'm not a geneticist, but it inhibits gene expression. So if you're turning genes off, you can imagine it's not very, uh, it's not a good thing, it's a lethal thing to that pest. And unfortunately, RNAi is slow acting. It takes quite a bit longer for that individual to die compared to BT. And so it's my understanding that industry is going to pair the interference with BT. So you have sort of a pyramided approach. Uh, it, has not, it has been approved by EPA, but uh, it's not released by Bayer yet because there are some export restrictions going on. And so more to come on that. Um, but I, I honestly I haven't seen it myself, but I would be excited to see uh, on a smaller level how the, the RNAi performs in Iowa. Okay, so just wrapping up a few take home points here, it's important to know what your corn look like. And it's also important to know that not every field in Iowa has a problem with rootworms. And even though we grow a lot of corn here, you can probably find corn rootworm in almost any field that you visit, but not all are at an economic level that's causing yield losses. However, to know that if you happen to be in continuous corn, those are the fields that are at highest risk for yield loss and just problems, uh, reoccurring problems, especially with Western corn rootworm. And so this is a pest that especially we need to be proactive on, and there's not a lot of effective rescue treatments. And so over time with continuous corn, you'll notice some of the signs of, of lodging or goosenecking, declining yields, and unfortunately more and more inputs in order to preserve the, preserve the crop. And so uh, I, I always hate to walk up to those cornfields that look like a disaster and all the corn is laying down because there's nothing you could do to rescue that crop. And so I don't want the, the uh, performance of BT or the other strategies to be something that happens to you. And so just a couple things to keep in mind. In 2019 or 20, if you happen to be in continuous corn or your clients, that's the number one red flag. If you're doing root ratings, anything above a 0.5, or for the adult monitoring program, anything above a two should be a level that you should mix up the management strategies. If you happen to plant late maturing corn or you have delayed replanted fields, that anywhere where you have green silks outlast in the neighborhood can become a sink for those adults that emerge later, and you can end up with more egg laying in that field. Uh, any type of weedy fields, weedy borders, any pollen source available to the females after green silk is also gonna be really attractive because they'll move to soybean, they'll move to weeds to get the pollen, and then they move back to corn to lay their eggs. And so if any of these things are true, maybe a couple of things are true, you should plan to mix it up because you will have at least that amount of injury. You'll have probably more adults, more larval injury the next year if you're planting corn. And so my best recommendation for a long-term strategy is to manage with confusion. You're constantly mixing it up because Northerns and Westerns adapt very quickly if you copy and paste your management from year to year. And so I just wanted to bring back, these are some strategies that I had said uh, people uh, think about for suppressing rootworms. And uh, in my opinion, and in the opinion of a lot of corn rootwormologists, crop rotation is the single most effective thing that you can do for a long-term strategy. And there are some places in the US where the crop rotation strategy breaks down, especially if you have uh, the Northern or the Western corn rootworm variant. For but the vast majority of Iowa crop rotation is going to help you. And it doesn't necessarily have to be 
corn, soybean, corn, soybean every other year. You could go every two, three, four years taking a break from corn, planting soybean. And so it really breaks up that life cycle and allows you a, a little bit more flexibility the next time you plant corn. The second most effective option would be to use a pyramided BT. And I think if you look in seed catalogs now, that is the vast majority of the options are two genes together instead of the single genes. And then if you have the ability and the interest to use soil applied insecticides, it can also be an effective strategy on the farm in some cases. But really our recommendation is to just mix it up, use confusion. And our, our takeaway is don't do everything all at the same time. If you're using BT, rotate that the following year with a soil applied insecticide or plant something else. And so I just wanted to circle back to my learning objectives. I hope that you have a better understanding of biology, scouting, recognizing changes in pest susceptibility, and understanding a few of the management options that we recommend for sustainable production of corn. So uh, you'll find me on Twitter. You'll find Ashley on Twitter as well. So we'll give updates on important benchmarks for scouting, assessing injury. If you want to be a part of the adult trapping network, please get in touch. And otherwise, we'll provide a lot of updates on our crops website. So I'll wrap it up there. And I think we'll have plenty of time for questions, comments. I'm interested to hear what you're seeing in the field. Thanks. Mm -hmm.